And so you can start recording. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Connecticut Children's Medical Center has submitted a certificate of need application for the acquisition of an intraoperative CT scanner to enhance its spinal and hip pelvic fracture surgical procedures. The cost associated with the project is estimated to be uh, $1,619,127.25. Today is June 25th, 2024. My name is Daniel Chuka. OHS Executive Director Deidre Gifford has authorized OHS General Counsel Anthony Casagrande to designate hearing officers for CON matters. And he has designated me to serve as the hearing officer for this matter, to rule on all motions, and to recommend findings of fact and conclusions of law upon completion of the hearing. This hearing is being held online utilizing the Zoom video conferencing platform as authorized by Connecticut General Statute Section 1-225A. In accordance with this statute, any person who participates orally in an electronic meeting shall make a good faith effort to state his or her name and title at the outset of each occasion that such person participates orally during an uninterrupted dialogue or series of questions and answers. Excuse me. We ask that all members of the public mute the device that they are using to access the hearing and silence any additional devices that are around them. This public hearing is being held pursuant to Connecticut General Statutes, Section 19A 639A, Sub F, Sub 2. Although this does not constitute a contested case under the Uniform Administrative Procedure Act, the manner in which OHS conducts these proceedings will be guided by the UAPA provisions and the regulations of Connecticut state agencies, Sections 19A 9 24, etc. Although I will be asking the majority of the questions today, Office of Health Strategy staff is here to assist me in gathering facts related to this application and may also be asking the applicant witnesses questions. At this time, I'm going to ask each staff person with me to identify themselves with their name, spelling of their last name, and OHS title, starting first with Stephen Lazarus. Uh, good morning, Stephen Lazarus, L-A-Z-A-R-U-S. I am the... Uh... Supervisor of the Certificate of Need Program. Thank good you, Steve. Morning. Oh, sorry. That's no, fine. You okay. can proceed, Annie. Uh, good morning. My name is Annie Fiella, F is in Frank, A I E L L A, and I am the CON team lead. Thank you. Now, Andrea. Good morning. My name is Andrea Harrison, H A R R I S O N. I am a planning analyst with the Certificate of Need Program. Thank you. Um, also present is our paralegal, Faye Fentis, who is assisting with the hearing logistics, gathering the names for public comment, and providing miscellaneous other support. Um, speaking of public comment, uh, sign up for public comment has started. If you would like to make a statement at today's hearing, please put your name in the Zoom chat, and we'll be happy to provide you with an opportunity to speak later on. Sign up will continue until the public comment portion is scheduled to begin. Uh, which will occur immediately following the technical portion of the hearing today. Their certificate of need process is a regulatory process, and as such, the highest level of respect will be accorded to the applicants, members of the public, and our staff. Our priority is the integrity and transparency of this process. Accordingly, decorum must be maintained by all present during these proceedings. This hearing is being transcribed and recorded, and the video will also be made available on the OHS website and its YouTube account. All documents related to this hearing that have been or will be submitted to OHS are available for review through the Certificate of Need portal, which is accessible on the OHS CON webpage. In making my decision, I will consider and make written findings in accordance with Section 19A-639 of the Connecticut General Statutes. Lastly, as Zoom notified you in the course of entering this hearing, I wish to point out that by appearing on camera in this virtual hearing, you are consenting to being filmed. If you wish to revoke your consent, please do so at this time by exiting the Zoom meeting. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to mention before we got more into the heart of why we're here. 
Um, the applicant previously submitted a motion for protective order relating to confidentiality of certain information that it wished to have protected from public disclosure. In particular, certain private pricing information that constitutes commercial and financial information, uh, the disclosure of which could place CCMC at a competitive disadvantage. I granted that motion. Therefore, there may be a need to enter into executive session later on. Uh, in the course of questioning, if that becomes necessary, I will go through the logistics at that time. The executive session Zoom link has already been sent around to uh, council and the other individuals who will need to be present. Uh, the general public will not have access to that link. Um, so I'm going to start by going over the exhibits and the items of which I am taking administrative notice, and I will ask uh, Attorney Jensen if there are any objections. Uh, the CON portal contains the pre-hearing table of record in this case at the time of its filing on Friday. Exhibits were identified in the table from A to W. Uh, Steve, Annie, Andrea, are there any other additional exhibits that needed to be added by OHS? Not yes. at this time. No. no. Okay, thank you. Um, the applicant is also hereby notice that I am taking administrative notice of the following, the statewide healthcare facilities and services plan and its biannual supplements, the facilities and services inventory, the OHS acute care hospital discharge database, the all payer claims database claims data, and if we uh, have reason to uh, look at specific data from that. We will provide the export and then uh, we'll provide the applicant with an opportunity to respond to that. And we're also looking at the hospital reporting system that's HRS financial and utilization data. I may also take no administrative notice of other prior OHS decisions, agreed settlements and determinations that may be relevant, but which have not been yet identified. If applicable, again, I will provide the applicant with an opportunity to respond to anything so noticed. Uh, Counsel for the applicant, can you please identify yourself for the record? Thank you, Hearing Officer Chuka. Benjamin Jensen from Robinson and Cole. Uh, I'm joined remotely by Connor Duffy, also from uh, Robinson and Cole, uh, on behalf of the applicant, Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Thank you. Um, so the exhibits that we went over in the table of record. Did you have any objections to anything uh, that was identified as A through W? No objections. Okay, thank you. Uh, were there any objections to the administratively noticed uh, inventories or documents? No objections. Thank you. So all identified and marked exhibits are entered as full exhibits. Uh, Attorney Jensen or Attorney Duffy, do you have any additional exhibits that you wish to enter at this time? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll proceed in the order established in the agenda for today's hearing. Um, I would like to advise the applicant that we may ask questions related to your application that you feel you have already addressed. We will do this for the purpose of ensuring that the public has knowledge about your proposal and for the purpose of clarification. I want to reassure you that we have reviewed the docket and we will do so again before issuing a decision. Anyone attending today should, ena should enable the use of video cameras when testifying or commenting remotely during the proceedings. However, all participants and the public should mute their devices and should disable their cameras when we go off record or take a break. Please be advised that although we will try to shut off the hearing recording during breaks, the video and the audio may continue. If the video and audio are on, uh, that'll still remain accessible to all participants. Public comment during the hearing will likely go in the order established by OHS during the registration process. However, I may allow public officials to testify out of order. Um, and we will get into that a little bit more later on. Uh, I do ask that the applicant's witnesses be available after public comment as OHS may have additional follow-up questions based on the public comment. Uh, Attorney Jensen or Attorney Duffy, are there any other housekeeping or procedural issues that you wanted to address before we got into this? 
Uh, no hearing officer Chuka, we're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, would you like to make an opening statement uh, on behalf of your client, Attorney Jensen? Uh, yes, thank you, Hearing Officer Chuka. Just briefly, uh, and good morning to the members of the OHS staff. Uh, on behalf of Connecticut Children's Medical Center, thank you for the opportunity to present today uh, in support of this CON application. This application is about the hospital's plan to acquire an interoperative CT scanning technology that will assist surgeons in safely performing complex surgeries on children. Uh, today, you'll hear from three witnesses, uh, Dr. Jonathan Martin, uh, Richard Casella, who are both here uh, with me at the table, and then also Dr. Mark Lee, who's joined us remotely. Um, and they're gonna focus their testimony on three primary issues. Uh, first, they'll explain the benefits of the uh, intraoperative CT scanning technology, which include improved precision, enhanced safety, decreased exposure of children to radiation, and reduced likelihood of complications and costly reoperations. Uh, second, they'll explain the process of selecting this specific device, the Aero CT technology, uh, over the other options that were available in the market. And last, they will address the structure of the transaction. Uh, for acquiring use of this equipment, which is designed to leverage the hospital's purchase of surgical supplies from Stryker Corporation in order to finance the acquisition of the device over a five-year term at favorable pricing. As this last topic was the specific issue that was identified by OHS to be addressed at this public hearing, uh, the witness testimony will make clear that this transaction is an industry standard commercial deal that is common for hospitals to enter into, including here in Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut Children's is dedicated to providing the highest quality care to the children in this state and the surrounding region. Uh, and a significant portion of those children are on Medicaid. Uh, this application will support that mission in a manner that is financially feasible and cost effective. Uh, after the evidence this morning is submitted uh, and the witnesses answer any questions that you or the staff may have, uh, we respectfully submit that OHS's statutory criteria have been met and the application should be granted. Thank you. Um, thank you, Attorney Johnson. I know that you've identified them uh, a few times at this point, but uh, if you can please identify all the individual individuals by name and title who you are planning to have make remarks, uh, I would appreciate that. Sure. Would you like to just introduce yourself briefly? And I'll, I'll swear yourself. them all in. I'll swear them all in after uh, they've identified themselves. My name is Richard Casella, spelled R I C H A R D. C-A-S-E-L-L-A. -L -L I'm the Strategic Sourcing Manager for Connecticut Children's. Dr. Martin. Good morning, hearing Officer Chuka uh, and other staff of the uh, OHS. Uh, my name is Dr. Jonathan Martin. Uh, I'm the Division Chief of Neurosurgery and the Associate Director for Trauma at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Um, and my name is spelled J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-M-A-R-T-I-N. And Dr. Lee? morning. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Lee, spelled M-A-R-K-L-E-E. -E. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and the division head of orthopedics and sports medicine at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Thank you. Can the three of you please raise your right hand? Uh, do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm, as the case may be, that the evidence you provided in your pre-filed testimony and the evidence that you shall give or have already given in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or upon penalty of perjury? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, do they have prepared remarks that they would like to make uh, this morning, Attorney Jensen? Uh, yes, they do. Okay. Um, so uh, when you are starting your remarks, I would just ask you to adopt any pre-filed written testimony that you have submitted. And uh, if you, to the, to the best extent that you can, please define any acronyms uh, that you may reference in the course of your testimony. Mark, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And again, Officer Trude, I appreciate the opportunity to present and speak to you today. Um, my name again is Jonathan Martin, uh, last name M-A-R-T-I-N, and I am the Division Chief of Neurosurgery at Connecticut Children's. My roles at Connecticut Children's include uh, ensuring access to care and enabling access to care, 
uh, for emergency and non-emergent uh, neurosurgical conditions for the children of Connecticut. My team provides more than 4,000 outpatient visits and 300 operative uh, uh, encounters for children here in the state. And through June of this year, 46% of those encounters have benefited uh, children who receive Medicaid. Um, our facility, as you're probably aware, is the only freestanding children's hospital in the state and one of two level one uh, trauma centers uh, uh, certified by the American College of Surgeons for pediatric trauma. Um, uh, my, my job in concert with Dr. Lee uh, is the delivery of uh, care for complex spinal uh, interventions. Uh, we also do obviously quite a bit in the way of uh, caring for children in terms of their skulls and brains. Um, uh, and the reality is that care of children uh, is my North Star and all decisions that I make uh, are really predicated uh, and determined by how I can best do that. Um, uh, my understanding of this, it's my first time testimony here, so testifying uh, in this committee. So um, I did some research in terms of what it is I needed to, uh, to do to present to you. And my understanding is you're here to determine the public need for the technology we're looking at, um, access to care, uh, making sure that this acquisition uh, ensures access to care and that it's cost effective for the children of Connecticut. I'd like to contextualize that from my perspective to hopefully help, uh, help you to understand uh, 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 and render a decision uh, that's appropriate in this case. First thing is understanding what this technology is and what it isn't. So uh, this is an intraoperative CT scanner. Many of you may have had diagnostic imaging before. This is not a test uh, that's done uh, to find a disease. We know the disease is there. And this is really a new tool uh, that we have to enable us to do things safer. And a way to think about this for you is imagine driving your car in 2024 without GPS or global positioning satellites to be able to navigate for you. I was an infantryman way back, uh, and I will tell you, pounding around in the woods and leading a fire team uh, uh, with a compass using dead reckoning is a whole lot harder uh, than doing so using GPS. So this technology, uh, particularly for something like pediatric neurosurgery or pediatric orthopedics, the ability to have the best tools available to care for children is very, very important. Uh, hopefully that, that gives you a feeling for what this technology is. Um, from the perspective of why Aero CT, why did we choose this? Um, uh, from, from the perspective of pediatric healthcare, we're 10% of the healthcare not in terms of what is spent on healthcare in the United States of America uh, on average. Uh, the reality is that uh, uh, a lot of the suppliers we deal with, they know this and they target uh, adults in terms of developing their equipment. So we're oftentimes sort of overlooked in terms of development, but not by AeroCT. They develop pediatric specific radiation protocols to reduce the radiation that's delivered to the patients we care for. Very, very important to us. Uh, and, and I will also say that from the standpoint of the implants that Stryker is able to provide us, they also can do the job of uh, uh, spinal instrumentation for our smallest patients uh, who are really most vulnerable, vulnerable and place at the most risk uh, uh, in the operating room. Um, uh, from the standpoint of the structure of this tech, uh, of this transaction, obviously, uh, Mr. Cassell is going to speak to that, but I will tell you in my, my role as a division chief, and I've served in this role uh, for quite some time here, uh, we oftentimes interact with industry, and this is a very standard uh, agreement. Uh, you know, there are uh, about 35, I believe, freestanding children's hospitals around the country in terms of the chiefs of neurosurgery at those facilities. I know pretty much all of them in pediatric neurosurgery. It's a very standard agreement that we do to try to acquire technology. Uh, again, speaking about Connecticut Children's, we're a not-for-profit healthcare center that right now is making a major investment, $250 million, and a tower uh, that, among other things, is providing access to fetal care and fetal surgery for children in the state. Uh, in terms of being able to make capital investments to benefit additional services like mine and Dr. Lee's, we sometimes need to be creative in terms of how we can do this. I have a mortgage that allows me to live in my home. It's nice to think that we have uh, uh, structured agreements that will provide uh, providers like Dr. Lee and I with access to this type of technology to improve the safety and care of children here in the state of Connecticut. Um, from the perspective of uh, um, uh, other thoughts, uh, I, I would urge you to strongly consider uh, our application. Uh, this is technology that we desperately need uh, in order to keep pace and maintain high quality care for the children of Connecticut. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Dr. Martin, you do just need to adopt your pre-filed testimony. I as well. apologize. Uh, for the record, I adopt my pre-filed testimony.
Thank you. I think next, if we could go to Dr. Lee, please. Uh, good morning again. Uh, my name is Mark Lee. Last name is spelled L-E-E. -E. I'm the uh, kind of orthopedic surgeon division head of orthopedics uh, and sports medicine at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Uh, for the record, I adopt my pre-filed testimony. Um, I am uh, first want to say I'm very proud to work at Connecticut Children's. Uh, it is kind of really I'm proud of the dedication and commitment of my colleagues uh, and myself to providing the highest quality care services for our young patients and their families. Um, oftentimes amidst very challenging and frightening circumstances, um, there really is nothing more precious for a family than the health of their children. Uh, and we take seriously our obligation to deliver care to all who presents connected children who need care, regardless of ability to pay or life circumstances. Today, um, I would really like to briefly emphasize several points. Um, you know, first, uh, a couple of points about this application in general. Um, number one, this interoperative scanning technology is essential to improving our ability to safely perform complex surgeries on children. <clears throat> Dr. Martin's uh, analogy with GPS is spot on. Complex anatomy is confusing. Uh, complex anatomy is difficult. Complex anatomy can be dangerous for the child. Um, so this allows us to make that entire experience safer. Uh, number two, Dr. Martin and I selected the AeroCT uh, technology specifically for the reason that it is best suited for pediatric surgeries. Uh, we perform at Connecticut Children's. Uh, it can image large bony structures like the pelvis. It can image small bony, uh, bony structures like the cervical spine. Um, number three, the acquisition of the scanner through Stryker allows us to continue working with a supplier that we know and trust and to finance the uh, purchase to spread the cost over a period of time. Um, it is really important to be able to work with people who are reliable. Um, you do not want to enter an operating room and have questions about whether or not the instrumentation will show up, whether or not the instrumentation is correct. We've just had a kind of more than 10 year relationship with this particular company and they've come through time and time again. They've become a part of the operating room and a part of the surgical process. So as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, um, I perform complex surgeries such as spinal fusions, often in concert with Dr. Martin. I perform a hip fracture and pelvic fracture surgeries on patients who are still growing. Um, so for this patient population, I am obligated to address the acute surgical need for the patient, but also to do so in a manner that to the extent possible allows the patient to continue to grow and develop in the long run. We wanna take care of the problem and not cause other problems down the line for the patient. Um, it is very essential that when I perform surgery, I'm in position to be as absolutely precise as possible in my surgery, including, for example, placements of screws, implants, and stabilization of patient's spinal uh, column. You know, uh, can, in this very delicate area, close enough is not good enough. You have to be exactly accurate. So the intraoperative CT scanner that Connecticut Children's is seeking approval to use is the gold standard for real-time imaging during complex cases. Um, walk into any hospital, adults or pediatric, um, outside of Connecticut Children's, and you will see this technology available for you. The ability to be guided in real time during a delicate surgery is essential to delivering the highest quality care for our patients, and the mobility, the mobility of the scanner allows us to wheel it into surgeries when needed and to move it out of the way when not needed, while providing the best quality images to guide our surgical technique. And remember, this is a very clear distinction between CT scanners in general. CT scanners are fixed devices where we move the patient to the machine. Uh, this is really cool. This is a machine that moves to the patient and addresses our need when we need it the most. So as the division head of the orthopedics at Connecticut Children's, um, I'm also re uh, responsible for ensuring that my orthopedic colleagues and the staff of the hospital have access to the best technology, supplies, and equipment so they can perform the safest possible surgeries for our patients. Um, as my colleagues will also discuss, and as Dr. Martin already has, Many other hospitals are already utilizing this intraoperative CT technology, and it is really imperative for Connecticut children to be allowed to do so. If you look around the hospitals in Connecticut, you'll find this technology, this very specific technology, the AeroCT, already exists. Um, again, we chose this particular scanner over other options in the market because we believe it offers the best image uh, resolution for pediatric patients, and it, because it is the only one with a pediatric-specific system and that provides uh, for reduced radiation for our patients. Um, additionally, um, the vendor for the AeroCT system uh, is Stryker. Um, again, in our experience, Stryker has a strong track record of providing excellent service and support to our surgical services. Uh, again, it is exceedingly important for us uh, that we partner with a vendor that we can rely on, and we believe that continuing to work with Stryker in connection with their AeroCT system is the best option for our patients. 
At Connecticut Children's, we have a robust quality and performance improvement in infrastructure, and we seek to reduce complications and learn from adverse events to improve quality and reduce costs and complications for patients. Um, the acquisition of the scanner furthers our ability to deliver high quality care because it can reduce the need for repeat surgeries, reoperations from errors and implant placements, um, as well as the incidence of additional complications. The scanner also reduces exposure to radiation for young patients, which is incredibly important for their long-term health. So approval of this application will increase the delivery of high quality care for our patients, increase efficiency, and can reduce costs in the long run. Um, acquiring and utilizing this scanner allows Connecticut Children's to benefit from imaging that technology that, again, most other hospitals have already. Um, I, I think it is important to understand that an 80-year-old patient, a 70-year-old patient, a 40-year-old patient has this ability to be safer, uh, has this technology that will make their surgery safer. But we don't have that ability for everybody under the age of 18. Um, so I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today and to submit my testimony. Thank you, doctor. And then uh, finally, Richard Casella. Good morning, hearing officer Chuka and the, uh, off of, and the staff of the Office of Health Strategy. My name is Richard Casella, last name C-A-S-E-L-L-A. -L -L I am the strategic sourcing manager for Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Uh, Working here has certainly been the most rewarding position that I've ever had in my career. Um, and I'm proud and humbled to be able to help uh, these physicians and our patients. In my role, I make certain that they have all of the right supplies, equipment, and technology to care for our patients. I have 35 years of experience in supply chain, procurement, and contract negotiations and have been with Connecticut Children's for six years. I've negotiated hundreds of purchase agreements for medical equipment with all of the major suppliers. The arrangement under which Connecticut Children's is acquiring the Aero Interoperative CT Scanner is an industry standard commercial deal, the same type that hospitals nationwide enter into, and was the result of an arm's length negotiation with Stryker. Connecticut Children's is not receiving a donation of this scanner or any sort of under market deal. Connecticut Children is paying fair market value for this scanner. As Dr. Lee and Dr. Martin explained, we did consider other scanners, but this one was the best fit for them and our patients. We did explore uh, and obtained a price quotation to purchase this product outright but we instead elected to acquire the use of the system through the use of a five-year embedded lease. Um, it's part of the larger arrangement to purchase uh, the implants that they spoke of. Um, a percentage of those uh, purchases goes towards the purchase of this equipment. In my experience, this is a common approach. We have used it several times here at Kinetic Children's for other pieces of equipment. Um, it reduces our out-of-pocket costs to acquire these these systems and the support and services that we need to, to operate that. It allows the hospital to leverage our purchases for the need of these implants and disposables to obtain the scanner as part of a bundled arrangement. The acquisition and the contract set structure makes sense for Connecticut Children's from the financial perspective as it reduces our out of pocket spend to acquire this essential technology for our surgeons and the other dollars can be spent more effectively for things like building the tower that was mentioned earlier. I thank you for your opportunity to speak today and will be available for any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Casella. Uh, Attorney Johnson, did you have any other additional comments you wanted to make at this time? I uh, did not, thank you. Okay. Um, so we're going to jump into some questions that I have. Um, I'm going to try to start out as general as possible and sort of narrow them down to more specific questions. Um, so the first question I have is CCMC has stated that this is a common arm's length negotiation contract, uh, but it has also stated that this presents a unique opportunity. 
Um, I was just wondering if someone could comment on how it could be common and unique at the same time. Martin, do you feel like you're... I, I, can you, I, I apologize, Officer Tudor, could you give me the, uh, could you give me the context of the unique comment that you're, that, that you're describing? In, in the application and the pre-filed response, um, it was stated specifically, this presents a quote, unique opportunity to acquire a CT scanner. That I can. I, uh, I'm not sure that I can. Uh, I don't see this as unique. I see this as, again, a very standard um, uh, 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 approach to acquiring technology. So relative to that language, uh, I don't know that. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, before I, I get much further, I did want to mention that so the, the specific public hearing issue that, that we had put in the request for pre-file was regarding the transaction itself. So pretty much all of these questions are going to be about that. <laughs> um, so um, let's see. Uh, but before we, we did get into that, Dr. Lee, you said um, that there are some long-term cost savings associated with an intraoperative CT for children. Um, are you aware of whether you have put anything in the record regarding uh, the long-term cost savings and anything to support that? Oh, I, um, I don't think I have placed anything in the record, but there is plenty of literature to suggest that uh, the implant accuracy is quite a bit better with an intraoperative CT imaging device or navigation. Um, and the long-term implications of this is that you have fewer returns to the operating room and fewer complications overall for the patient. In the catastrophic example of an implant, implant placed incorrectly around the spinal cord, um, the consequence is paraplegia for the pediatric patient. And the long-term cost of taking care of that child is huge. So if you magnify that over uh, kind of many years and many patients, um, that is what we're speaking to. Uh, that this is the long, the initial investment really pays itself out for preventing these uh, costly complications in our patient population. So as a late file, to the extent that you can find some of that literature that would um, support that, um, that would be helpful to us. Specifically, any any sort of long term cost savings that that may be associated with it. Um, but if if the documentation or the the peer reviewed studies simply say like, this is the best option and it'll it'll prevent complications down the road, that would that would also be helpful. And hearing Officer Chuka, I would. Also, just direct you to our um, first completeness letter, which was submitted, uh, which is uh, Exhibit G, I believe, or excuse me, our response, which is H. Exhibit H. Yep. Um, at page six, where we also provide an estimate of one to two hours per surgical case being saved. Um, without the need for hardware repositioning. Okay. Thank you. Um, and hardware repositioning, does that require a second surgery or would that be within the same surgery? So, Dr. Lee, you're Dr. 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 Lee, go ahead. Yeah, oftentimes it's within the same surgery. So um, we have uh, kind of more primitive 2D imaging um, kind of capability right now. If the hardware is malpositioned on that imaging, or if there are neurologic changes, then at the same time, we undo the stuff that we've done, and then we do it again. And so that adds time to the operating room. Okay. Officer Chuga, I'd also speak that uh, prior to having intraoperative imaging like this, that clearly required a return to the operating room, uh, uh, because we would identify this on a diagnostic CT scanner after the fact, typically on the first post-operative day, and there definitely have been circumstances in the past uh, where a return to the operating room is necessary based on the position uh, of hardware that was identified after the anesthetic. Again, the ability to identify that in real time in the operating room uh, uh, results in our ability uh, to avoid those types of returns. Um, and obviously the financial um, uh, implications of that in terms of additional anesthetic, 
um, the emotional challenges for families to have to uh, return to the operating room. Um, uh, all of those things are very real and, and we live and walk those every day. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, so Dr. Martin, you said that this, this sort of transaction is very common. And Mr. Casella, you said you've you've used this sort of transaction several times uh, in the six years that you've been with CCMC. Um, do you currently have any other uh, any other acquisitions that are subject to the same sort of uh, contractual negotiation and agreement? Yes, we have hearing officer Chuga. Yes, we have several. Um, there is we we've recently done one. Uh, with Medtronic for uh, our NEARS system, which Dr. Martin can explain far more eloquently than I can. Uh, we have a, a similar system for uh, our Stryker Neptune product that we use. So this is not unusual for us. Um, there are others that are smaller in nature. Those are two larger pieces of equipment. Um, we've just signed one with a company called Trianum, which supports some of our respiratory patients. Uh, which provides some free blenders with the purchase of um, the consumables that are used for um, for the respiratory ther uh, therapy. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Martin, are you able to to speak more about the the nears the Neptune or the the free? The free blenders. So you, that's for ENT. Oh, okay. I, I apologize. So it it is a Dr. Martin does not use that product. It's a, an ENT product, it, and it's used to. Um, it's a cerebral temperature monitoring system. Okay. I can certainly speak to you know our prior um, uh, our prior imaging uh, system for spinal instrumentation that is not uh, um, uh, cross sectional in nature. So thinking about a, a CAT scan, to, just so you understand how that works, imagine you have a donut, okay, and, and with a camera that can move around it 360 degrees uh, to provide uh, imaging uh, that, that is essentially like taking a loaf of salami and slicing it up um, any way you want. You can actually take a look at that entire volume of tissue. Um, that's, that's, you know, state of the art, uh, current best way to image where screws are. Uh, in the past, you know, we've used the system that was uh, fluoroscopy based. So this looks like a more conventional x-ray, uh, right? We've all seen them, you know, sort of held up to a white box. Um, our prior um, acquisition of uh, uh, intraoperative fluoroscopy unit uh, in 2018, I believe, yes. used a uh, supplier uh, equipment agreement as well. So that I can certainly speak to. We have that technology. That's how we acquired it previously. Again, not, not a new process for us. Um, and Mr. Casella, I think you, you said that one of them that you're aware of right now is with Stryker. It's regarding the Neptune. Is that correct? Correct. It's a fluid management system, a waste management. Okay. And we purchase the consumables and they provide the hardware to us at no cost. And generally speaking, how are your experiences with Stryker, uh, with respect to that uh, acquisition? They, they have been a very good partner to us. Um, did you find the acquisition to be cost effective in the long run or in the short, short term? It, it, both in the long term and in the short term, yes. They, they are cost effective uh, because they allow us to preserve our capital funds for uh, other activities. And for any of those prior acquisitions where the same sort of uh, agreement took place, um, were there any cost analyses that were performed by CCMC either during or after the fact, prior to, during, or after the fact to determine whether that would be the, the best option? Yes, we have worked with our finance department to ensure that they are cost-effective deals. Um, 
was something like that performed for the the striker in Neptune? To your knowledge? To my knowledge, no. Okay. But I can tell you that that we did a rather exhaustive uh, when we purchased the um, scene through the the previous piece of equipment that Dr. Martin spoke of in 2018 through Stryker through this same purchase program. Okay. The full blessing um, of our controller at that time. So. I think Dr. Lee said that you you CCMC has had a, a 10 plus year relationship with Stryker. Um do you do you happen to know the exact period of time that you have been contracting with Stryker? Um I can give you probably an estimate. I think um it's probably been about uh for the spines division, probably about 20 years. Uh, they've been here since I joined the hospital, um, and um, I think the uh, the reps have certainly changed over time, or the representatives from the striker company. Um, the company is, itself has changed over time, um, but the service has always been uh, excellent. Uh, so it's uh, about 20 years, I would guess. And I'd, I'd speak, Dr. Officer Tuga, from the standpoint of... Um, uh, my relationship with Stryker Spine uh, dates back to 2018. It was a very memorable event for me uh, um, because Medtronic, who I had typically used, uh, didn't answer the call. And I had a child with a spinal cord injury and I needed instrumentation there. Uh, uh, and uh, they failed to come through. Uh, I had a relationship with a representative from Stryker because uh, Dr. Lee uh, had used them uh, in the past. And I called him uh, uh, in a moment of need, and he delivered. Uh, and, and when we talk about what we do, um, uh, I, I think in the adult world, when you look at these, uh, uh, these systems and these implants, ultimately what many adult degenerative spine surgeons are doing is 500, 700 degenerative cases. Um, it's, it, it is a factory uh, in terms of uh, work that is done. And we are not, we are not high volume. We are just incredibly high complexity. Uh, and the, 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 uh, the margins of safety are much narrow, narrower. Um, and our reliance on one another, um, uh, both from the standpoint of clinical reliance on someone like Dr. Lee, but also my reliance on someone who's going to answer the call at 2 a.m. when I need them is so very important. And I think Dr. Lee alluded to that, but I, I want to personalize to you the difference that that makes for, I don't know if you have a child uh, or a nephew or a niece, but the difference that it makes having someone who will answer the call and carry the message is so critically important. Those relationships are important to us. And something you just said raises a question uh, for me. So. Are the implants and the disposable items, um, are those sort of purchased in bulk or are they purchased on a, a per patient basis? So in, 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 so the majority of the instrumentation sets, just um, uh, for context for you, um, most of those sets don't sit on our shelves. So we have some sets that are actually here in house. In many cases, based on the complexity of what we do and the low volume, high complexity nature of what we do, um, those sets are in short supply. They're sent around the country. And when we need them for cases, they can be brought in. Um, so in general, what I would say in answer to your question, um, uh, the, purchase that, the purchases that we need um, are done on a case by case basis based on the needs uh, of the children that we have. Um, so both those implants uh, uh, and the tools to insert them are things that are brought in um, uh, on a case uh, by case basis. Does that answer your question or did I go in the weeds there? No, that, that answers it. Thank you. Um, so that have there been any occasions over the past uh, 20 plus years in your relationship with Stryker where they have 
sort of unexpectedly increased the costs of any of the goods that they were offering? No, sir. There is a price list that's associated with this agreement that has a fixed cost for the term of the agreement. Um, that I, I'm happy you brought that up. Uh, I, I didn't see that anywhere in the record. Um, and that may have been because it was uh, considered confidential. Um, but I would like a copy of that as a late file. Uh, not because I'm interested in any of the pricing, but because I just want to make sure that it exists. <laughs> um, so uh, would that be possible, Attorney Jensen? Uh, yes, I would just request permission to submit it confidentially. I, I think that'll be fine um, for the, the same reasons you articulated in your, in your previous motions. I'm not going to ask you to submit a separate motion on that. Thank you. Um, so exhibit H, that's the, now, now I'm going to start getting into some more detailed questions. Exhibit H is, uh, CCMC's response to the first completeness letter. Uh, you have included a master agreement with Stryker as well as the equipment placement schedule one, which includes an exhibit A. Um, these documents are found at PDF pages. 10 through 16, I believe. Uh, I don't think those had Bates, Bates numbering, so I, PDF pages 10 through 16. Um, so these documents haven't been executed, or at least the, the versions that were supplied to OHS haven't been executed. Uh, have there been any changes to these uh, since they were provided to OHS in March? Not to our knowledge. There's been no changes to those documents, no. Okay. Um, other than the price list that we just discussed, are there any other schedules or exhibits that have not been included as part of the response to the completeness letter? We're not aware of any, but if there are, we would submit it as a late file. Okay. Thank you. Um, Annie, Steve, are one of you writing these down? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, in the documents that have been submitted, uh, it didn't look like there was any redaction, but I know sometimes uh, with a redaction, you can make it like white instead of black. It, to your knowledge, has there been any redaction to any of those documents? There was not. Okay. Um, in the pre-filed response to the issue, uh, Mr. Casella stated in his pre-file that the transaction presents a significant discount to Stryker's standard prices. Um, how do Stryker's standard prices for surgical implants and disposable products compare to other vendors' prices, not accounting for the discount? Just to clarify the question, uh, and I do wanna caution that this may get into the subject matter that we have moved the protective order on. Are you asking about the pricing of the uh, intraoperative scanner and suite of services as well, uh, specifically, or about the surgical implants and disposables? The surgical implants and disposables. Are you able to answer that question in terms of the costs of the striker products as compared to the rest of the market? Um, I would need to reread that because I believe that the statement should be that we've exchanged the discount for the purchase of the equipment. Okay. So if I, if I fail to, to submit that properly, uh, hopefully we can make a change to that. But 
the, the supplies themselves are not discounted. Okay. And I think, to, just to clarify, hearing out Sarchuka from the testimony itself, it, it, it describes that that discount is being applied toward the acquis ultimate acquisition cost of the scanning technology. So instead of the discount being received on the actual purchase, it gets applied to the, the overall acquisition cost. Uh, so at the end of the five-year term, uh, the uh, hospital will be able to purchase the device itself for $1 because those payments will have been made over five years applied to the cost. Is, is that consistent, Mr. Cassell? And, and hearing officers too, if you could allow me just to, to go, go forward and try to explain that a little better. In the previous purchase that we had made for a different, the fluoroscopy piece of equipment that Dr. Martin spoke of, we received, there was a portion of the implants that was applied to the purchase of that. That percentage was significantly less than the percentage that we're now applying to the era. So by those, by that methodology, that discount that we're getting is almost 75% higher than the discount we previously purchased, we had based on the percentage that was applied to the capital equipment. Does that okay. make sense? Is, does that clarify it? Yes. Okay. Um, we we may have to come back to that. I just need to wrap my head around it a little bit more. <laughs> sure, that that's fine. Um. So, you said that the prices for the implant products and the disposal products are fixed for the entire five year term. Is that correct? Correct. Um. Is there a, a separate agreement uh, related to those, the, to, the, to the acquisition of those disposable products and equipment, or is, or is the one that has been provided the only agreement that is in place? That, that, is, that is the agreement that's in place. There, okay. There's a master agreement that, that goes with that and some uh, appendixes and some, some other exhibits. So we may have just for brevity not included the 372 pages, and I'm not sure the exact number, so please don't hold me to that. But there is a lot of implants. And there are separate purchase orders then executed for Correct. purchase of specific products. Correct. When we need when we need one of those those products, we issue a separate purchase order. Okay. Um to your knowledge, is there anything that prevents Stryker from increasing the prices? over the course of the five-year term? Uh, I believe there's a force majeure clause that's in there. So if something strange happens in the marketplace, they're able to do that. But for the most part, it's a uh, fixed cost. Yes. Um, so, Based on the pre-file, it says that CCMC has agreed to a maximum amount of $2,923,150 being applied towards the purchase of implants uh, over the five-year term. Uh, what would happen if CCMC meets this financial obligation uh, prior to the end of the, the five-year term? We would then have the right to renegotiate the pricing of the implants or to seek um, a new a new contract. And then buy out the piece of equipment for a dollar. Okay. Hearing Officer Chuka, I just wanted to make sure I understood your question correctly there. You're asking about, I believe we represented that there is a maximum amount of the purchases of surgical 
in plants and disposables that can be applied to the ultimate purchase of the equipment. I think that's the 584,000 per year over a five-year term that would get to the 2.9 million. That's not, um, we can spend more and we do project to spend more on implants and disposables, correct? Correct, but those percentages still go towards the cost of the equipment. So we had a, a dollar value that we committed to. And if we exceed that by 50%, our contribution exceed goes up by 50%. And then once we hit that $2.9 million mark, then we have the right to purchase the equipment buy out the lease and renegotiate the, the consumables. All right. So I, I want to go back one, one second and maybe you've, you've answered this question um, already, but the, the price list that you have negotiated with Stryker for those you know, other products, um, has there been any sort of analysis conducted as to whether those prices are higher or lower than other vendors? We did not consider other spinal implants. Okay. Um, to your knowledge then, it's possible that strikers, these negotiated rates are higher than other providers, other vendors? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, but you don't. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No. I just wanted to clarify though, are you then considering the discount that's being applied to the purchase of the equipment? No. Okay. So okay. you have the pricing for the, the disposables and the implants, but then you receive money that is paid towards those that is applied to the purchase of the equipment over the five year term. So it ends up being a 35% discount sure. off of those prices that are listed. Um, in the, and I'm sorry, but correct. is that all correct? Yes. Officer Chuga, if I may, um, uh, simply because I, I've had a prior relationship with Medtronic in terms of looking at pricing of spinal instrumentation. That's that's the system that I I used prior to 2018. Um, and there was, there was never, when we had both of those systems in-house, there was really no difference in cost between the two implants uh, when we were talking about um, uh, a, a circumstance where we weren't acquiring technology. Clearly, uh, they're in the business of uh, business, and we understand that. What we are, uh, what we are um, accepting under the circumstances of acquiring this piece of technology is that uh, yes, uh, indeed, the discount that we used to receive uh, is, is is no longer there because ultimately, what we're receiving is both the implant and access to a technology to make care safer. Um, so uh, I, I hope that answers your question. I, I think if we were looking at a circumstance where we were negotiating, and again, you're asking me for my opinion and I'm offering it to you. Um, if we were negotiating with Medtronic for their comparable system, the O-Arm, which doesn't have the other pediatric advantages that we discussed, um, uh, they would indeed charge us a higher price. And based on my prior experience dealing with both companies, their prices are essentially the same. Okay, that's helpful. That helpful. Yes, thank you, Dr. Martin. Yes, sir. Um, so, equipment schedule one, which is page thirteen of Exhibit H, it uh, there's a defined term called products minimum. And if you, you need to pull that up, you can. But it, it says $850,000 each semi-annual period at the prices described in Schedule 1, excluding taxes and freight. Um, so what, what, so it's referring to prices in Schedule 1, but there are no prices in Schedule 1. So I, I'm just trying to make sense of that. <laughs> So uh, apparently you you don't have the full document because schedule one is the list of all the implant price. So we'll make sure that you get that. Okay. And just to I, clarify, I'm looking at page 13, which is 
called equipment schedule number one. Is there a, there's a separate schedule? Oh, there's two schedule ones. Okay. That, that would certainly make things confused. So that, that would be helpful to, to have the full document. <laughs> um so exhibit a to equipment placement i understand that ccmc has agreed to purchase at least 1.7 million worth of disposable and implant products per year uh but this agreement has a requirement that ccmc purchase at least half of that every six months or $850,000 every six months. Um, I, I think, so at some point, CCMC spoke to what its experiences have been over the, the previous few years with, with Stryker. Um, has it had any issues with clearing that $850,000 hurdle over uh, any six month period? Uh, I can probably speak to that a little bit. I think the numbers are based on our previous usage. Um, and it was very important for us going into this structured contract that um, we not have any uh, kind of um, kind of far reaching expectations of usage. Uh, we wanted, we understood we did X number of cases, we treated X number of patients, um, and we did not want to be in the situation where we were trying to operate more to kind of meet these goals. So these numbers are very much based on uh, kind of what we've done in the past. Uh, and from that fluoroscopy uh, contract previously, um, that seems to work out very nicely. We're under no pressure to do more than we have, and we treat exactly the number of patients that we'll treat. Okay. Um, to your knowledge, have you exceeded the 850,000 for six months? For the past, I don't know, like three years or so? Not to my knowledge. Um, so I guess the, the question then is how can CCMC provide that assurance now going forward if it has not been able to do that over the past three years? Wait, I just want to clarify. We've met the targets based on previous uh, implant usage. Uh, we okay. are not expected to exceed that number. There's no, uh, you know, we made very clear that we are not shooting for kind of any number far beyond that. This is what we can do. So I maybe the, my questions will become more clear as to why I'm asking this uh, as I get into some other questions. Um, so the, the, that, so section three of schedule one states that if CCMC does not meet the semi-annual payment threshold, it'll have to pay the difference. Um, so you would essentially be paying the difference for no product in return. Is that correct? And Dr. Lee, you can address this. I, I do just want to make sure that we're using the right terminology here, when we're talking about exceeding the $850,000, you're talking about that being a minimum spend, projected spend per six months. Do I have that right, Hearing Officer Chuka? Yes, that's correct. So Dr. Lee, can you answer the question then with that understanding that we're talking about uh, the, the need to meet that minimum goal of $850,000 in spend per six months in order to not have to trigger the obligation to, to make an excess payment? Yeah, again, you know, it is based on prior usage. We haven't had any issues meeting that number, and we don't expect to based on our prior volumes. But uh, there is written into the contract a penalty kind of for not meeting that number. Absolutely. And we understand that. Officer Chuka, could, could I offer, um, would, would it be okay if I posed a question to Dr. Lee that may be illustrated here? Um, uh, sure. Dr. Lee, to the best of your knowledge, over the past uh, um, six years, going back to 2018, when the zine was introduced, have we had problems meeting the targets that have been set uh, by uh, the supplier equipment agreement for it for that contract? Yeah, we have had no problems meeting the targets set. And again, I would echo, to the best of my knowledge, and I'm, uh, I'm certainly involved with the uh, um, uh, uh, or purchasing frequently, we've not been penalized uh, based on not meeting volumes. 
and this contract was based on the same the, the same uh, uh, use assessments as the prior. Does that does that help, sir? It does. Thank you. Yes, sir. And um, maybe you, uh, Mr. Casella can address this, but the the if you come up short on the eight hundred fifty thousand, that just means that that money you need to would need to pay more to go toward the ultimate acquisition of the scanning technology, correct? We would need to make up the shortfall on the purchases. Yes. So you wouldn't be paying money for nothing. You would be paying money to go towards the, the scanner. Is that right? There are several options should we wind up with a shortfall. And we haven't had a shortfall in this agreement since we've signed it. Um, we could have the opportunity to purchase some of the standard sets that Dr. Martin spoke of so that we could make up that shortfall. Um, my expectation is, is that we can also negotiate a, a change in the term with Stryker and perhaps extend the agreement should we need to, but I don't expect that we would need to. Um, does that encourage overbuying of products or does everything get used and it's there's no sort of excess purchasing? We, we wouldn't purchase product to discard it, no. Okay. Um, So still looking at exhibit H, but a different part. Uh, question eight, in response to that, you stated that CCMC expects to spend more than its annual average of 1,850,000 on striker disposables and implant products due to anticipated increases in surgical volume. Um, but looking at the surgical volume in the application, there is no increase. I was wondering if somebody could speak to those seemingly contradictory statements or how, how do those two reconcile? Oh, I can, uh, so, you know, we have projections of, uh, population and volumes, uh, and growth of the hospital. So we do anticipate that in the future, we'll probably be doing more uh, kind of cases with the implants. Um, I think our track record so far is we maintain a consistent volume, but these are like projections for the future. And so I, I, beyond, you're, you're, the projections provided are for 2024 through 2026. You're speaking beyond 2026, Dr. Lee? Yes. Okay. And also, I, I would also I, I, um, add on to that. I, I think there are several initiatives going on within our hospital system that include an expansion into Fairfield County. Um, and again, the $250 million tower uh, that we discussed. Um, uh, you know, the, the reality is our, our CEO, um, Jim Schmerling, um, has the experience of introducing a fetal surgery program and having a halo effect that impacts every program in the hospital, right? While, um, you know, certainly... Uh, NICU will, will, will be probably the most direct beneficiary from that. The reality is those children, when they are born, they require additional services. And so, yes, sir, we, we do anticipate growth throughout the hospital system based on a strategy for growth within the Connecticut Children's Network. Okay. Um, have there been any analyses that, that would support the growth? Uh, that is expected. Uh, the answer is, I'm sure. I'm sure we can get some information uh, um, on growth projections for our healthcare system as a whole to you, sir. Um, can we? Yeah. Uh, and specifically, as they relate to the the increase in surgical volume that you're expecting, and and the likely increase in in purchasing that will be necessary from Stryker, if it's possible to to make it that specific. I'm unsure about the specificity of that, sir, in, in terms of that, but uh, we will certainly give you those projections on growth and, and do the best we can to provide you with those numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, 
is there a so going back to what we were talking about earlier where uh you were discussing uh purchases occurring on a case-by-case -case basis is there a minimum number of cases that ccmc needs to have in order to meet the minimum spend target for this contract yeah i would say in broad terms yes um but it depends on the complexity of each case uh higher complexity usually higher implants but uh there is a minimum number of cases needed to reach that tar uh, spend target and do you happen to know what that minimum is? I can just base it on uh, my surgical volume. It's uh, somewhere between 60 to 80 uh, high complexity spine deformity cases a year, but that's not the only, those aren't the only cases where we use the implants. Uh, but I, I can tell you the somewhere kind of in that range is kind of what's been sufficient for the past several years to meet the targets. Um. And then the past five years, have you experienced lower volume than that, than that target? Uh, not, you know, I, I know that COVID happened. No, no one is, is forgetting that. But um, other than that period of time, have, have there been any periods where you've experienced a lower volume? Yeah, other than COVID, which is essentially 2020 to about 2022, 2023, um, every year the numbers fluctuate. Uh, but we always uh, approach a minimum, the minimum target. So anywhere between 60 to 80 cases is the typical volume for those uh, spine deformity cases. Okay. Um, So it sounds like what you just said is that you can buy implants for cases other than what the machine will be used for, and that will go towards the $1.7 million annual minimum. Is that correct? When I say the machine, I mean the CT scanner. Yeah, so I, I think if you're saying, can we use the CT scanner for other implants? Absolutely. Um, but those implants will not go to the cost of the CT scanner. So uh, for high complexity pelvic cases, we may use trauma implants. Um, and that is, uh, we can use the CT scanner to help us with that particular case. Those implants are from a different vendor. Actually, I think the question was actually different. I think the question yeah. was, are you able to use the surgical implants and disposables for other procedures where you would not use the intraoperative CT scanner? Is that, is that right here in Officer Juco? Yes. Uh, yes, you can. Okay. And those would go towards the 1.7 million annual requirement? Okay. Yes. Um, So going back to the, the master agreement and schedule one that was provided, um, it looks like there is some flexibility provided to Stryker to adjust prices for taxes and changes in interest rates. Um, what assurances can CCMC provide that despite these possible price increases, the deal will continue to be cost effective rather than going through a standalone lease? I mean, if we're, we're able to, this, this may be a, a matter of legal interpretation of, of the contract terms related to what a, an event would be uh, that I don't know that our witnesses are able to, to provide. We'd be happy to address that separately, uh, unless, Mr. Casella, you have any information on that. I, I don't. Looking for that now. What section is that in? At section three of the master agreement and schedule one to the master agreement. It's section three in both of them. I, I think I think it would be best if we answer that 
separately as opposed to trying to read it and interpret it now? Yeah, I mean, the, the legalese is hard to get through. I understand that. <laughs> um, so if you want to do so, if you want to submit that as a late file, that would be fine with me. Um, just a couple more questions and then we can take a break and then we may have some additional questions after we regroup uh, internally, but um, how does, how does, so if, if this is such a, a great deal for a CCMC, how does Stryker benefit from this transaction? Yeah. I mean, I, I think Stryker uh, yields better payment uh, for the implants during the duration uh, of this agreement. I, and I think that's, I, I think that's been clearly stated. I, I don't, I, I, I believe we've been transparent in terms of both our acknowledgement of that and our anticipation that that makes good business sense for them as well, sir. Is, um, is, does that make sense? Yeah. And, and I think the other thing it does for them uh, that may not be as obvious is um, it does not do a company uh, uh, any good to be perceived uh, as uh, uh, as poor quality. And uh, uh, you can have an implant be perceived as poor quality based on the fact that it breaks. You can also have an implant be considered poor quality if the surgeons are not getting good outcomes. I don't look at an intraoperative CT scanner any differently than I do a table saw, a drill press, a hammer. This is another tool, right? I mean, uh, when I think about, we did not get to the moon in 1969 by having the US government work in isolation. We partnered with industry to put people on the moon. Um, I'm not an astronaut, there are no illusions that I am, but what we do is a very highly technical and specialized skill. Um, and uh, I can't do my craft uh, if I don't have good tools to be able to execute the work that I do. Um, and the reality is that technology has advanced at a pace uh, where uh, tools like this are very, very important to ensuring good outcomes. And the equipment suppliers know this. And, and they know that when I present at a conference and my outcomes are seen, uh, if those outcomes are poor, it reflects poorly on them. So I, I see this as, um, from a business perspective, yes, uh, uh, they end up yielding more per implant. Um, that's good for their business model. It's good for me because I can get access to technology that I need to serve my patients. Um, but there's there's also this recognition uh, that uh, medicine has become increasingly more complex. As a patient or a family member, your expectations of me are higher uh, as well. You expect, you demand good outcomes. Uh, and I'm here today advocating to make sure that I can do that for the children of Connecticut. Thank you. Um, and the last question I have right now, um, I wasn't able to figure out what would happen if, I, I know you have said Stryker is very reliable and you've been with them for many years. Um, from the documents provided, I couldn't tell what would happen if Stryker, for whatever reason, wasn't able to keep up on their end of the deal. So, like, if... For example, they were suddenly not able to continue providing with the disposables or the 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 uh, the implants. Uh, what would happen to the CT scanner? Would that return to Stryker, or would you engage in some sort of buyout of of whatever is is remaining on the balance? How would that work? Yeah. That, that's a that's a great question. I, I don't know that we know the answer to that. I don't think we anticipated the fact that that Stryker, who's been a a leader in this marketplace, would exit it. Um, so I don't think that we considered that as as an opportunity or a concern. I think that probably it would have to be some type of a buyout. But I mean, that would be a very unusual and unforeseen circumstance. Okay. 
And just from the perspective of, again, a legal question about what would happen in the event of a breach by the other party and what the remedies would be, I think that gets outside what the witnesses today are able to address. Yeah, that's, that's when Attorney Jensen would find himself in court. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so that's all the questions I have at the moment. I do want to take, let's say, like a 15-minute break. Um, and I may have some additional questions. Uh, Attorney Jensen, if, if you have any additional follow-up, uh, feel free to uh, address those questions with your witnesses afterwards. Um, so we'll come back, let's say 10.40. Um, and again, just a reminder, if you're attending from the public and you would like to make a, a public comment, we will uh, be doing that immediately following the technical portion, which, uh, We'll probably end close to 11. Um, and when we stop the recording, the video and audio will probably continue. So be sure to turn your video and audio off if you uh, don't want to be seen. So thank you. And I will see everybody back at 1040. Uh, welcome back. For those just joining us, uh, this is a hearing concerning the CON application filed by Connecticut Children's Medical Center, docket number 23-32616-CON regarding the acquisition of an intraoperative CT scanner. Um, I did have one additional question. Um, so you've stated that in the past you have performed cost analyses in conjunction with uh, CCMC's finance team. Uh, why was a cost analysis not performed for this acquisition? Was the was your testimony before that there was a cost analysis done? There was a cost analysis different... done for the prior deal with Stryker for the ZM okay. CR. So then the question is, if anyone uh, can address this, why was there not one done for this particular one? Oh, Dr. Mark. Yeah, I, I would comment on Officer Pachuga. Uh, from, from our perspective, while we certainly look at competing technologies, um, uh, the Mazor robot um, uh, uh, and Mazor system, the OR, they simply lack a pediatric specific application. So I don't know that they were really comparable products. Uh, and again, one of the challenges that we face is the tools that we need are not the tools that many in industry want to develop because it's not as lucrative a market for companies as pediatric applications. We struggle. I will tell you when I started in this business back you know, in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, what we put children's spines back together with uh, was uh, was a hodgepodge of instruments uh, that some of which were not even developed for the spine because we had no other options. Uh, and the fact that the Aero CT um, has pediatric specific radiation protocols was really a big seller for me. Um, I spend a ton of time talking to families on a daily basis about whether their child should have diagnostic imaging, right, outside of the operating room, uh, or not based on exposure to things like sedation and radiation, right? If you get a CT scan right now of your head, you acquire a one in 1,000 risk of developing likely thyroid cancer over the course of your lifetime. If your child does, it's a one in 500 risk. Um, and the reality is the reason for that, some of it has to do with uh, their size and exposure, but a whole host of that is related to dose protocols. So do I want to be able to sit there and have a conversation with families saying, you know, um, I, we got, uh, maybe we negotiated 10 cents less on an implant for you. Um, uh, the state's really happy, but you can rest assured that your child's now at higher risk to acquire cancer over the course of their lifetime. That's not really an argument that I think people that will resonate with patients and families. And for us, the fact that we have these pediatric specific protocols was, uh, was at, at the end of the day, um, uh, 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 the most compelling reason why we settled on 
this technology with this vendor, sir. So the Arrow CT is the only device that is able to provide the, um, this low of a dose of radiation? It's the only one with the protocols that are designed for that. That's correct, sir. Okay. And are there other vendors who also offer the Aero CT, or is Stryker the only one? Mark can come too, but to the best of my knowledge, they are the yeah. only vendor, sir. Yeah, Stryker is the only one. Um, Medtronic, there are competing platforms that don't have the pediatric specific protocols. Uh, like from Medtronic, um, it can have from Globus, uh, Mazor Robotics. Um, we examined all these. Um, and the one that fit our needs best was this Arrow CT. If there were other vendors who could offer it, we certainly would have discussed with them you know, additional uh, other contract options. But this was the like, only company that supplied it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so those are the only questions that I had. Um, Attorney Jensen, did you have any follow-up that you want to conduct with any of your witnesses? I do not. Okay, thank you. So, um, I think it makes sense to do uh, the late files now, just to run through those, and then we can do the public comment. And if there are any additional questions, we can ask those after the public comment, but otherwise we'll uh, I'll just ask you, uh, Attorney Jensen, if you want to make a closing statement, and then we can we can end the hearing. That'll be fine. Uh, and not to interrupt, Attorney Officer Chuka, but would it be possible to release the surgeons? Uh, I don't know if there will be specific questions for them, but they do have a uh, surgeries to get to today. I think would be if if at all feasible. I'd request that. Um. Let's. Okay. So ignore what I just said. <laughs> um, let's uh, address public comment, and then immediately after public comment, they can they can uh, be adjourned. <laughs> I appreciate uh, that. We can Thank proceed you. with our day. Um, Thank you. Thank so, uh, I don't believe there is any anybody who has signed up for public comment. Is that correct, Ms. Fentis? Correct. Okay. So no one has signed up for public comment. So yes, you can be adjourned <laughs> or relieved. Um, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you all being here. Um, and thank you for answering my questions uh, as completely and, and candidly as, as possible. Um, so we're going to do uh, the late files now, and I will issue a separate order that that sort of identifies these uh, with greater specificity. Um, the first one is evidence to support long-term cost savings of use of intraoperative CT scanners. Number two is the full document, the full contractual document, including the fixed price list. And any portion of that that is potentially, you know, commercial or price related can be submitted uh, under seal. Um, number three is support for CCMC growth projections beyond 2026, specifically with regard to surgical volume increase. Number four is confirmation of the cost effectiveness of the deal after accounting for any possible price increases related to taxes and interest. And that's specifically in regard to section three of the master agreement. Um, Attorney Jensen, did you have any questions about any of those? I just want to make sure I heard one point. Uh, on number three, you said projections, did you say beyond 2026? Or what was the time frame? Are we looking at the five-year term of the, the 
the proposed deal? Right. Okay. Yep. That was my only question. So oh, I, I guess it would be an additional three years beyond the surgical growth projections that have already been provided, which go through 2026. So we'd be looking at 2027, 28, and 29. Understood. Thank you. Um, and again, I will issue a, a separate order on that. And if you have any additional questions, uh, we can address those after the, the order is issued. Um, do you have a, any closing remarks you would like to say at this point? I, yes, and thank you, Hearing Officer Chuka, and thank you again for everyone's uh, attention to this matter today. I believe the evidence today established three important facts. Uh, first being that this in, intraoperative scanning technology will help the surgeons at Connecticut Children's perform complex surgical procedures on the brains and spines of the children in our area in a more precise and safer manner uh, that reduces their exposure to radiation, uh, and reduce potential for complications and reoperations that can be you know, candidly catastrophic to these kids and their families. Uh, second, the selection of the Aero CT scanning technology, uh, which is sold by Stryker and exclusively by Stryker, uh, glad we were able to address that during the evidence here, uh, was the result of a careful process uh, by, the, by the individuals involved uh, that emphasized the specific needs of the pediatric surgeons at Connecticut Children's uh, to, pr to protect the children that they're operating on and to uh, work with a vendor that they trusted. Uh, and I, I think that the testimony from Drs. Martin and Dr. Uh, Lee really emphasized how important that is to work with a vendor that they trust and, and, and to partner with them. Uh, last, uh, as a non-for-profit organization, it's Connecticut Children's you know, responsibility uh, to, to manage its costs and to run its business in a, in a responsible manner. This transaction accomplishes that. So, so this is a supplement, and Dr. Martin got to this. This is really, this technology is a supplement to the supplies and, and surgical implants and disposables that they're already using. This is a, this makes those tools more effective, which is why it's logical and makes sense to bundle this arrangement. This isn't some unrelated purchase of, of, of one type of supplies to buy a totally different technology. These, these tools really work hand in glove, and, and that's what Dr. Martin specifically was describing. Um, Connecticut Children's is able to take advantage of the benefits of its purchase of those surgical implants, which it's going to buy anyway, and has over you know, this entire period of time um, in order to obtain favorable financing terms uh, and to lease and ultimately purchase the Aero CT scanner uh, over this five-year term we've discussed. There is a cost, to be clear. This is not a, a gift. It's not any sort of, a, as Mr. Casella said, it's not an undermarket deal. Uh, it, the cost is just embedded into that overall transaction, into the overall uh, purchase of those supplies. So in doing so, Connecticut Children's is able to avoid incurring a really significant upfront capital expense and instead allocate that available capital to other uses uh, to benefit patients and families. Uh, so these facts taken together with the evidence submitted uh, in support of the application clearly demonstrate that I think each of the applicable statutory criteria have been met that I know, Hearing Officer Chuka, your, your ultimate decision will address. Uh, just briefly, access to care. Connecticut Children's accepts patients regardless of their ability to pay. Um, and as uh, Dr. Martin mentioned, uh, the payer mix includes you know, in excess of 45% of Medicaid patients. Uh, all of those patients, Medicaid and otherwise, will have access to this technology. Uh, and they will benefit from this technology to have safer procedures. Uh, and next, because the surgical time is reduced for these procedures, Connecticut Children's will have increased capacity to perform additional surgeries, uh, limiting the time needed to schedule those procedures for patients and their families. Uh, quality of care. The testimony today fully explained how access to this scanning technology improves the precision and accuracy of complex procedures on the most vulnerable patients, uh, and particularly their brains and spines of young children while at the same time reducing unnecessary exposure to radiation. This will improve the results of these procedures and limit complications that can lead to costly uh, and emotionally draining additional procedures for those families. A lot of the emphasis just by nature of what the issue was that was identified for this hearing is on cost. And I, and I understand that. Um, but I do want to be clear that we can't look at this, and certainly the surgeons and Connecticut Children's don't look at this as a race to the bottom. 
This is, they need to work with vendors that they trust. Uh, they need to be able to work with tools that they trust that they believe can provide the best care. The challenge, and which I think has been met as shown through the evidence today, is to do that in a cost-effective, financially feasible and responsible way. And I believe that's been done. The, the last point I wanted to make clear on the quality of care point, though, is that there are candidly limited options available in the marketplace specific to the pediatric population. They have to work with what is available. Uh, this is the product that they felt had the best uh, ability to address the needs of pediatric patients and with a vendor who was the exclusive vendor for that product. Fortunately for them, it is a vendor that they, as I said, had an extensive track record of working with and that they know and trust. Uh, financial feasibility. Connecticut Children's has carefully structured this transaction to limit its upfront costs, uh, excuse me, to limit its upfront capital outlay and taking advantage of its forecasted purchase of related surgical implants. As Dr. Lee mentioned, uh, they're confident based on historical trends that they will meet those minimum thresholds and allow to obtain the full anticipated benefits of this transaction. Um, additionally, getting toward the cost point, uh, this was also addressed in the testimony. The ability to wheel this, uh, the scanning technology in and out of operating rooms is also a major driver in cost savings because it is not a fixed uh, item that requires a separate room that has to be retrofitted with uh, lead in order to make sure that there's not added exposure. This can be wheeled in, it can be wheeled out. There's no additional capital expenses that have to go along with the ability to use this technology. Uh, last, and I know I've already addressed this, but I do want it to be very clear. This is not a donation by, by Stryker. This is not something that we are getting for free. It's an overall transaction that I think if you look at any part of it in isolation, it may not, you won't capture the full picture of what the benefits are to Connecticut Children's. Um, but it is a part of a bundled total purchase of surgical implants and disposables over a five-year term, along with the tool, the uh, scanning device that allows them to be more effective in the use of those, uh, of those products. Uh, cost to consumers. Uh, this is made clear in, our, in, in the application and the responses. There will be no additional cost to patients or payers uh, as the cost of the scanning technology itself is built into the fixed price of the surgical procedure. Consumers won't see additional costs for this. And, and in fact, and when you look at it from the system-wide effect of this, there will be reduced cost because of the minimized operating room time, as I mentioned, uh, an anticipated one to two hours less uh, in terms of uh, the actual time in the operating room when you're able to take advantage of this technology. Uh, that means shorter patient stays and reduced need for reoperations. Uh, utilization of existing services and providers. Connecticut Children's does not currently have this technology, right? So this is, we're not asking for a second or a third. They do not have this technology. There is no ability to take advantage of its benefits at Connecticut Children's. And then in terms of other providers, Connecticut Children's, as has been discussed, is the only freestanding licensed pediatric hospital in Connecticut. Other hospitals have access to this technology, uh, but it's for adult patients, right? And it's not the specific technology that's the benefits of the reduced radiation dosage um, and, and the other items that doctors Lee and, and uh, Martin addressed in order to best treat pediatric patients. It's not available in the area. Um, and, and finally, in terms of demonstration of need, I'm hopeful that the, the testimony from Dr. Martin and Dr. Lee were both very passionate about this, uh, and rightfully so, uh, show that there is a clear need uh, in the community for this technology and to provide enhanced and safer care for the children that are subject to these really complex uh, surgeries. The, the consequences, as Dr. Martin addressed, are so dire uh, that, that it would really be doing a disservice to, to our children in this state if we're not giving our surgeons the best tools available to them in order to perform these surgeries in the safest possible manner. Um, as Dr. Lee mentioned, adults have access to this technology, children do not. And that's just not right. Right. There is a need for children to be able to have access to this technology, and the transaction we proposed addresses that. Uh, just to conclude, uh, the goal of this application is to enhance the access to quality care that the children in this area need and deserve. Uh, Connecticut Children's thoroughly researched this technology, and they thoroughly researched the other available options in the market. And they selected a product and negotiated a transaction with its vendor in a fiscally responsible manner that allows its dedicated surgeons to do their job to the best of their ability while controlling the expenses to the hospital and reducing the overall cost to the healthcare system in Connecticut. 
Uh, so for these reasons, we respectfully submit that the certificate of need application uh, should be approved. And thank you very much for your time again today. Thank you, Attorney Johnson. Um, something occurred to me uh, as you were speaking. Uh, we didn't go over when you think you would be able to get the late files to us. Do you have an estimate of the amount of time you might need? If I'm just going to put you on mute for one moment, if that's all right, let me just confer. Absolutely. If you want to go off the record too, that's that's fine. We can come back in five minutes or... Uh, would three weeks be all right? Yeah, that's Seven fine. Days. Yep. All right, so I, I will include that in the order. And, and certainly if we have it available sooner, we'll, we will we'll provide it as soon as we can. Okay. I just know with the holiday next week, uh, there may not be as much opportunity. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for attending today. A reminder again, that written public comment can be submitted up to seven days from now at concomment at ct.gov. Uh, this hereby concludes the hearing, but the record will remain open until closed by OHS after receipt and review of the late files. Um, thank you very much for your time, uh, Mr. Casella and everyone else in the room and Attorney Duffy. And I will, be seeing you in the future, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.